uh, Daniel here today to give us a guest lecture. We will talk about HPC interconnect. Uh, you know, cluster networking is always a very important issue, and we covered it a bit in our main lectures. And uh, uh, Daniel will talk about a more specialized issue in HPC interconnect. And I checked the uh, the latest top 500 supercomputer at least. And uh, there are 18 supercomputers uh, are produced by Google, which is the company that Daniel comes from. And uh, the, 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 the best one is uh, number 11. That's right, so, yes. Yeah, in France. I, I think Daniel you know, is uh, kind of in the core area of the supercomputer. Uh, so, hand over to you. It's okay. Uh, I believe I've got 15 minutes. And um, hopefully I'll keep to time. Um, so, who am I? Um, I used to be a lecturer at Manchester University um, until I realised I could get paid more in industry with less stress. Um, so my career, I did a degree actually in engineering, in civil engineering, but I was, I was developing three-dimensional finite element models that used the supercomputers of their time. So my, my PhD and my postdoc stuff was using big vector computers of the time, particularly big Fujitsu and Cray vector computers. Um, then I went on, I was a lecturer for, and I taught computer science. I took Fortran to uh, first year undergraduates at so 9 o'clock on a Monday morning and they didn't want to be there and I didn't want to be there. But that's what we had to do. And I spent a bit of time working on CESAR, which was the current UK academia. There is a central big Cray computer up in Edinburgh. Edinburgh Power Computing Centre, and they run a service called Hector, which provides all the UK universities with big high-end HPC. And they also have a MSc course in HPC, and they also, um, their graduates enter the job market in the UK looking for jobs in high-performance computing. <coughs> so you're a competitor to them. Anyway, I left the university um, uh, 12 years ago, and I moved uh, to Bristol, and I've been there ever since, and I've worked for uh, Quadrix in particular. Quadrix are a, or were an interconnect company, they developed their own interconnect, so I was closely involved with the developers, developing the topologies and the software and the routing algorithms for that. Uh, I then went to work for ClearSpeed for three years in Bristol. Um, they are a bit like um, your NVIDIA's uh, and your Intel 5's, but they were the, a predecessor of them. They had a great product, but they didn't have a good software programming language, which is why they died out. Um, and then for the last three years, I've been with Bull. And what I do is help um, configure systems in the bids, um, put bids together, and get involved in the technical side of installing them uh, and running benchmarks on them in particular. I'm working out why you can take a cluster and not two nodes have a really pathetic bandwidth between them, yet all the other nodes have a good bandwidth between them, and then delve down to find out it's something to do with the particular route two nodes use to communicate with each other. Um, some of the projects I've been involved with, quite a few of the universities, like the University of Liverpool, Coventry, Cardiff, um, Loughborough, uh, but we also have some commercial work. Um, the Manufacturing Technology Centre is in Coventry, uh, Worth Research design Formula One racing cars, and AWE design nuclear bombs. Um, so in terms of the pedigree of Bull in HPC, um, I'm afraid I've, I should have updated. There are 18 systems in uh, November 12, um, three systems above the petaflop. Um, and two of the systems are in France. Terra 100 is at the CEA. They also design nuclear bombs. Um, Curie is a spin-off from uh, CEA. And that's a two petaflop system, and that's the headline cluster that Bull do, and then there's a system uh, over in Japan. All three of those share the same technology, and I'll come back to that in a bit. And you can see in these racks, these glowy lights are um, blade chassis, and the idea is you build your cluster out of two levels of hierarchy, a blade chassis with a number of nodes in each, with an integrated InfiniBand switch in our case, and so you have these chunky building blocks, in our case of 18 nodes each, and you start connecting all those together with more InfiniBand. So you have two levels in the network, and I'll come back to that as we go along. But all those effectively are the same type of technology, but a fat tree topology with InfiniBand. So really what I'm talking about today is, say, well, really answer the question, why do you need an interconnect? Uh, what the purpose of the interconnect is, and what it 
uh, job it performs. I will look at some topologies. I believe you've already had a previous lecture looking at topologies, so that'll be easy. And if you ask any questions, you'll get them all right. And then I'll look at the different choices in terms of solutions, uh, different vendors, and different sorts of interconnect. With a couple of graphs at the end, because every presentation should have a graph. Um, so, why do you need a interconnect? A long time ago, if you looked at the top 500 list, there were computers in the top 500 list that had one CPU. Uh, it's been mm, probably 20 years since the last system in the top 500 had a single CPU, but there were systems in the old days where we had a single CPU. It was a very expensive CPU, the CPU consumed hundreds of kilowatts, and the CPU itself would have taken several whole racks to fit in because the CPU wasn't a single chip. But they were the power workhorses of the time. And so when people wrote scientific computing in Fortran or C, then you wrote a program, von Neumann style, list of instructions, you do this instruction, then this instruction, then this instruction, and go round and round. And those programming languages you see in Fortran were based around the idea that you have a single CPU executing instruction. Languages, particularly Fortran, understood the idea that although there was a single CPU executing your instructions, it could do more than one thing at once. So in Fortran, if you wrote a loop in Fortran, it always did have this concept that if it knew that each pass of the loop was independent of the other, it could do two or three or 50 at the same time. So vector computers um, exploited that, and they had in them a the it either, you could give the compiler a hint or it just knew that this loop could be done and it, and it could do eight things if there was eight vector units in, on the heart, in that CPU you could do them eight at once but we've now moved on to that and now HPC systems and there are a couple I made earlier um, that's actually one of the Quadrix ones the biggest one that Quadrix ever produced um, they, are consist they consist of hundreds, in fact thousands of nodes really, and, and now really tens of thousands of nodes. And each of those nodes is not just a single CPU. Each node is at least two and sometimes four sockets, and each socket is nowadays at least eight cores. So they have these multiplication factors. You've still got vector processors. So although I said in the old days a vector computer was a single CPU with eight vector units, you still got that nowadays. Your, your um, latest Stanley Bridge processors from Intel, say, have got vector processors for handling SIMD type instructions um, inside there. So you have these various multiplication factors, which is why you've gone from systems that could do a few gigaflops or teraflops, and now you have systems that do petaflops. And if you think of your iPhone, iPad, whatever, a system that you can look back and say, this thing I've got in my hand my smartphone would have been the fastest machine in the world if you go back 15 years or 20 years, depending on technology. But it, it shows how things have moved on, but what you have in your hand, in your pocket, uh, would have been banned in most countries of the world because it's capable of designing a nuclear weapon. And now we all carry them everywhere. And they're more powerful than boxes like some of these. So this is why we need an interconnect because we've gone from a programming model that has a single instructions that may have vector units to a system where you, where you run into one computer that has some very few but very powerful processors to a system now where you have thousands of nodes and they all need to communicate to each other. So the problem you're trying to solve is that when you're running a program, it has data on one computer node that another computer node needs. And so you need to move that data around, either explicitly, explicit programming languages like, what's that awful one people use? MPI, that one. Um, it'd be great when MPI gets, uh, gets surpassed by something better. But for now, we all use MPI. And that has an explicit programming model where you write in your program MPI send to send data to somebody else. And there's an MPI receive at that end to get the data back, to read the data that's been sent to it. So I say that's an interconnect it serves that purpose of really trying to get back to where we were 20 years ago, where one program could see all the data. And some programming languages let you do that, like Coray Fortran, 
like UPC and some of these global uh, shared memory programming languages. I don't mean physically shared memory, I just mean programming languages that let you see the memory as if it was shared. Um, but because that is difficult, then most of us use a message passing idea where you explicitly send data to and fro. And that's where the internet comes in, because it's the transport layer, you move the data. And so what you're trying to do at the interconnect is ideally you want one wire going from each computer node to the other one that you want to communicate with. Because if I send data from a process here to a process here, ideally I want one wire between them, one data cable, <coughs> network connection, so data goes down that, that cable. And that would be ideal, but the reason why you have these different topologies is you can't do that, or it's very difficult to do that, to try and connect everything. Um, so what you could, could, could do is, before you run your program, a man comes down to the machine room with a bunch of cables and connects them together to connect the nodes that you're going to use in the, in the order that you need them. Um, but we don't do that, not anymore anyway, did 50 odd years ago. Um, so you have a network which is designed to be good for the sort of application you want to run, but the application may not use a network in the most useful way. So in terms of how you build an interconnect, there are really two ways of approaching it. Um, you either do the top row or the bottom row. The top row is where you take a typical computer. It could be um, any desktop PC like the one that's uh, connected to this monitor down there. Um, or it could be a nice rack-mounted server um, designed to go into a data center. But the idea of those is go away. Um, that you can take any typical computer, connect a card in there that has a industry standard connector, PCI Express, um, typically say, or hypertransport. Um, it plugs into a socket in the motherboard. Uh, if, you, if you take that design one step further, you put the chip on the motherboard and design your own custom motherboard. But it's still effectively the same thing, um, connecting a standard server with a generic network cards will fit into any, any server of any manufacturer. You connect those together with cables that connect to something that's a switch. And that switch has chips on it which connect data coming in one connection through the switch, through another switch, out to another connection um, to where it's being used. And that's the generic solution, switches and cables and switch, um, network cards, NICs, network interface card. The other way of doing it is where you integrate it into the fabric and you have one chip which acts as both the network card and the switch. And typical days, the Cray, a typical Cray computer is an example of this, um, where if you like, the, the computer is the network. Where you, th you it, when you think of it, you think of the compute nodes. The, you build a network of these little square boxes connected in a 2D, 3D grid, and then you hang off them a computer node. So you have this formal fixed structure, which is the data network, and hang off those, the, the, the computing CPUs themselves. Um, and these sort of networks have very high bandwidth links between them. And the data gets through a switch chip, and through a switch chip, and through a switch chip, it becomes daisy chains along. And we'll look at both, both of those as we go along. So in terms of how you do the topology, uh, of course there are lots of simple ways of doing it. If you have six servers, um, you could just arrange them in a straight line. And that's great, except that it's a long way from there to there at the ends. So they're not all equal to each other, because sometimes it's data going from there to there will use the same wires from there to there, so they will share a link, so that link will get a bit congested. So you take that and put a wire from end to end, and you get a ring. So now, if these two communicate, and these two communicate, they can go the one way or the other way and avoid that, um, that hot spot. Assuming your routing algorithm understands which is the best way round. That's why we have algorithms like min hop, minimum hops, that says the route from there to there should be this way because it's shortest. But it doesn't take into account the fact that that link is already congested by another traffic. It really should go the long way around. So that's the simplest way, a line, and turn it into a ring. There are other ways of doing it. Um, you can just have some arbitrary interconnection of any way you like. Um, a star type idea where one server is the master and you have the workers hanging off it. Because many 
task farming like parallel programs are like that. You have your C program running on the master node that reads a data set and it partitions up the data into subtasks that it gives out to its worker nodes that do the calculation and give the result back to the master. And in those type programs, the workers don't talk to each other. It hands out work, calculates it, like Hadoop type things, there's no communication between the individual workers. It's hand out work as fast as possible, get results back as fast as possible. And so in those, a start topology is actually what you want to try and achieve. And if you're doing that task farming on one of these or these topologies, it's not ideal. You've, you've come up with a topology which is good for some algorithms, but not for the one that you're using. Um, likewise, a, a development that is the, is the tree, where the master node sends data to workers, but those workers then send data to more workers. Um, because in a task farm like that, you may have a master and a thousand workers. It'd be quite congested if that one node got the results back from a thousand workers. So in a tree, which you can imagine there's more branches coming down here, um, topology, you have the master sends work, splits the work in this case into two pieces, and those two pieces split it into more. And so there's a hierarchy, some nodes one node is the master, some nodes receive data, tasks and work, do some processing themselves and split the data off to others. And so in those, those topologies would be ideal. Um, there's also the bus idea where you have one wire that connects everything and everybody, can, everybody sends data on the bus. Like the bus-like topologies like you used to have in the old days for access to memory um, and peripherals on a PC or USB or whatever. Um, Possibly what you'd really want is that, a fully connected network, which we'll come to on the next slide. In a fully connected network, every compute node is connected to every other. Um, I've just put in a cluster to Cardiff that's a bit like that as a hierarchy, which I'll come back to. Um, but ideally, you connect everything to everything else. But if the algorithm you're running is like that, you've spent a lot of money on expensive networking that you're not using. So there's always this trade-off when designing a an interconnect that most of the time you're trying to run a general workload and the interconnect topology you come up with is never the right one for any application but it's at least bad um, for, the, for the general consensus of, of applications. Um, so say that's the, that's the perfect um, network where each compute node connects to all the others. There's a wire between every pair, but you're going to have a lot of cables. And so if you start looking at the metrics of those, that sort of network, it has a diameter of one. So I mean, uh, you've probably come across the term diameter before, but if you haven't, diameter simply means how far away it is to anybody else, to the furthest away person. And so you only have to go down one link to get to the, any other node, so the diameter of the network is one. Uh, the number of links is clearly every node has a link to all the others, so every n nodes has a link to n minus 1 others. Um, the bisection is very good. Um, when we'll come to the term bisectional bandwidth as we go, go through these things. The idea of a bisection is if you cut a, make any arbitrary line that cuts the network into two distinct pieces, it doesn't have to be a straight line, it can be any wiggly line, as long as it cuts and puts half the nodes on one side and half on the other. The bisection bandwidth is how many wires you cross if you cut this network into two halves. Because the worst possible case for communication, perhaps, is where half the nodes are communicating with the other half, and all the ones in one half are communicating with the node in the other half, not with one in their own group. And so if you design a network which is, has less connections in the middle than the periphery, um, <coughs> then you won't get good performance. If, half, if the nodes in one half are communicating the other half all through that congested bit. And the area, which is the amount of space it takes to implement it, rises dramatically. It's to the fourth order. So people do not build networks like that beyond very small ones. Um, inside a chip, if you have a chip with four CPU, physical CPUs, it would be like this, or eight, if you have an Intel server, which Intel CPUs can have servers up to eight CPUs and AMD as well on the same server, they will often have this topology where all the eight have a connect to all the others, but that's about the limit. You'd never build one of those with more than eight endpoints. Um, there's a picture on the next thing of a crossbar. Um, so 
Direct everything to everything else is the ideal, but you can't afford that. So the next best thing you could try is a crossbar. There's a picture of a crossbar on the next page, which we'll see. Um, the crossbar basically has switches that connect on demand any node to any other. Um, there are a lot of switch connections. Um, you can use it as a building block for other things. So actually, if you look at an InfiniBand switch, if you buy a 36-port InfiniBand switch, it is a full crossbar. But you wouldn't build a network bigger than 36 ports with the full crossbar because the cost scaled as n squared. There are n squared switch connections because every input's got to be connected to all the, every other output. The last machine in the top 500 that had a full crossbar was the Earth Simulator in Japan. Uh, that machine was the top of the top 500 list for the longest of any system. I think it spent five or six consecutive lists. Over three years it stayed at the top. Um, but it was a massive machine. Because it was a full crossbar, the system was built on two floors. There was a full height floor, this height, with all the computer servers, and there was another floor below it that was only about that high. Uh, you've seen Being John Malkovich, the film. If you haven't, there's a bit in that film where they have a floor that's only about that high. And in that system, they built the building around the computer. And the Earth Simulator, there was, a, there was a floor below the main floor where the computers were that had all the networking. And because with a full crossbar, there are a lot of connections. A lot, a lot of connections. Um, so that's what it looks like uh, as, an, as a concept. You have, in this case, we've, I've drawn eight CPUs at that end and the same eight CPUs at the top. And the idea is, if you're trying to communicate with this one in binary, number 101, um, number if that one is communicating with this one, then there's a switch there that gets switched on that connects this wire running straight across with this wire running down. That gets connected, switches on, all the others are switched off, and any data travelling from him goes straight to there, to the target, to him. Um, the dam to the network is um, simple because it's just in fact it's two, because it's one wire to there and one wire to there, with one switch between them. And everybody, can, everybody has the same relationship to everybody else. So any node sending data to anybody else has the same bandwidth, latency, and characteristics. You just switch on the switches where you need them. It's a great idea, but the number of switches you need is n squared. So you're not going to build a thousand node system out of this because you'll need a million switches. But a small system, you'd build them out of. And indeed, as I said, InfiniBand switches are, are exactly this, but 36 by 36. Um, as an example of a ring network, I used to work for ClearSpeed. Uh, that was our co-processor. Um, it still has a better uh, flops per watt than anything from NVIDIA or uh, Intel. Um, it was a SIMD computer. SIMD is an architecture that's... Um, was popular a long time ago and was thought of as being the future of parallel computing, um, but now is only used as a small scale. Uh, that was the chip that we did at ClearSpeed. That has one master processor which runs your program, your Fortran and C, and it has 96 parallel SIMD engines that issue instructions in lockstep, in parallel, if you've done about SIMD instructions. Those, the normal way is you send data from the master to each of the 96, like a star, but it also has a ring round all those workers, like that, where every node could send data around the ring. And so in some algorithms, you can imagine there's an algorithm, um, there's an algorithm called scan, uh, which is basically what you use if you want to, if each of these six had a number, and you want to know the total of all six. One way of doing it is you send the data from him to him and add them together, so he now knows the answer to those two, send it to him, add them together, go around the ring and eventually when he gets to there you've added done six editions and six steps and got the answer. Um, you can do that algorithm a lot faster by everyone sends one step to the left and adds and steps two steps to the left and adds then four steps to the left and adds. Um, that's called scan algorithm where you you can actually compute the sum of n numbers in less than n steps. But a ring network simple to implement on a chip um, there's only one link for each node. Um, the amount of space you need is order, order n, but the nodes are equidistant. If you need to send data from him to him, it takes three steps, which is three lots of time periods, and from there to there is only one. 
So if there were 96, this processor had 96 of them. You can imagine the time taken to send data, the worst case, is actually 48, where you've got to go halfway around the ring, because you assume you go the other way around if it was the other way. So some algorithms, if you send to the next node along, take one time step, but the furthest away took 48 time steps. So it has its limitations, but some algorithms work well on those topologies. Um, so then you get into meshes. Uh, a 2D mesh is, you just take the example of the Cray and draw it in 2D. These are your computer nodes and your switches. You build a mesh like that. The diameter is obviously um, the number of links. If you've got P across here and Q up there, in this case, 5 by 5, there are um, the furthest away from anywhere to anywhere else is from here to here, where you've got to go four steps, as in P minus 1, plus Q minus 1 steps up that way. And it doesn't matter whether you zigzag through the network. It always takes four horizontals and four verticals to get from the opposite to one corner to the other corner. Um, so that's the network diameter, well illustrated, how many steps it is to get between the furthest two points. The number of links um, is that equation. Again, you can work it out yourself because um, you've obviously got for every P1, Q minus 1, that one's got two links. So there's two links. Every node generates two links. So it's 2 times, in this case, 16. So the 16 nodes that have a link going up and a link going to the right, which leaves these nodes over here. These nodes have one link each, which is P minus 1, and those links have P, Q minus 1 as well, so P that way and Q that way. Um, and it only takes order n. And so some people build networks out of that. However, you can improve that because if you've spent the money on building that switch chip that has four links, you're going to use the same switch chip there, and now you're wasting one of the links because you're not using it. So the obvious thing to do is you then connect that one to that one. And that's the only difference between a 2D mesh and what's called 2D torus is that you connect from the end back to the beginning again. And it looks like that. So now when you communicate with him to him, and you used to take four steps, you can now do it in one because you can go round the loop the other way. And it's called a torus because the only way you can draw that and not have the wires crossed is on a donut. Um, you can imagine that drawn, top topologically drawn on a, a nice jam donut. Um, so you've only added one extra link in each direction, so it's only a linear increase in links, but you've greatly reduced the bandwidth, the, the, um, the diameter. The diameter's gone from P plus, about P plus Q to half of that. You haven't increased the area you need for it, and you haven't, you've only mildly increased the number of links. So many topologies are built out of not that, because it wastes links, but that. And in fact, what people do is, because even that's limited, uh, you, make, you do the 3D version of that, which is harder to draw, um, but it's simple. Before I go on to the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about routing. If you know where you are in the grid, as in your three across and two up, every node needs to know a way of how to get to anywhere else. And in a mesh or a torus, routing's simple. If, you're, if you know that you are one across, one up, and you're going to communicate with him, you know that you are five minus two, you're three steps to the, left, to the right, and you're one step down. So your routing algorithm can be right, 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 up, and it will go from here to here that way, right, 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 up, or could be right, right, up, right, or could be right, up, right, right, or up, right, right, right. So there are one, two, three, four routes from there to there, there are four different routes that get there in the minimum distance. In real computers, you either have that explicitly, and that you could have everybody going right first, then up. But then, if you take these two nodes, they would also use the rights, three rights, then up. And the, you're overusing the horizontal connections. They're sharing horizontal connections that you don't have to do. So then you get to a better algorithm where some of the nodes go as right as far as they can before they go up, some algorithms go up before they go right. And some have a random choice. 
There are four routes between there and there. What's often found, the best routing algorithm, is every node knows how to get from there to there. In this case, there are four ways of doing it. When it comes to sending a message, it picks a random one of those four. Because coming back to what I said earlier on, in an internet, it's not, always, it's not often about producing the best network, it's producing the least worst. And if you write a, an arbitrary C or Fortran program, and everybody uses the same idea of how to get from somewhere to somewhere else, you get congestion. So by having a randomization in there, breaks away that pathological case where all the links, the same links are being used for too many things. And so some algorithms, some networks like the Miracom network, had a static routes between two endpoints, but randomly picked which one to use to avoid the worst possible case. Um, the 3D torus is just the same as a 2D one, except you now build it out of, there's now a third dimension in there, it's hard to draw. Um, you can imagine eventually those will wrap around, the greens will wrap around to the beginning again. And Cray seemed to favour three-dimensional um, toruses. Again, you can extend the same thing. The diameter is now uh, three times um, P, Q, and R. Uh, or N is the number of nodes. And there are now three links. On average, every node has a link to its, its right, its up, and its behind. So there are, on average, three links per node. Three ends, total number of links, and you can follow things similarly about how much space you need. Um, as in, if you double the size, the amount of links you need goes up by that amount of area you need for the interconnect. Um, the other popular network, apart from those, but seems to have died out, is the hypercube. In the hypercube, take the cube case. You, you think of your node as being the corners of a cube and you have one link to your three corners that you're adjacent to. So these three nodes from here, these three are one link away. These three over here are two links away and the opposite diagonal is three links away. So nobody is further than three links away. So the diameter is simply the... In 3D is three, in 4D it gets difficult to draw four. When people have implemented this, SGI, most of SGI's computers until recently were um, these, this topology, Hypercube. But they weren't, it's only if you bought an 8-node computer it would look like that. If you bought a 16-node computer it would look like that. In Manchester we had a 128 and a 256-node cluster. And so it's like that in many dimensions. It's hard to draw, but concept-wise, if you have 128 nodes, it's a uh, seventh order, eighth order hypercube, seventh order hypercube. Um, what makes it clever, though, is when you think about the routing algorithm, because I said before about the routing algorithm on the other one, the routing algorithm on here, as well, scribble, um, change colour. If you think of, I'll draw the other links in as well. Not very cube by cube. Call up my first node. In binary, it has coordinates 0, 0, 0. And if I have this one here, and let's say x is first, this is x, that has coordinates 1, 0, 0 in binary, because you've gone one step in, um, in x. And the one over here, is 1, 1, 0. Oh. The routing algorithm for a hypercube, the simple one, is for every node, if you know you're trying to get to him, so that is node, obviously node 6, because it's 4, 2, and 0, added together make 6, and he is obviously node um, 0, and he is node, well, turn which way around, you don't do the x and the y. Um, Let's call that node 3 in that notation, because I've written x at the, at the beginning. Um, that's node 1. So the routing algorithm on a hypercube is you take your starting point, your endpoint, and you do an XOR of the start and the end. Probably to see that. Exclusive OR is where you... A zero and zero give a 
zero got one and zero given one and all that. So you know from there to there you've got to go, in this case a simple case, you've got to go one, one, zero. You've got to go one step in x, one step in y, and don't have to go any step in z if that's the z dimension. So if you want to write the routing tables, it's dead easy because you know that wherever the packet is in the network, it knows where it is in the network, to go to the next link or the target, it just has to go, it has to keep going until it's, because once it's moved one step in x, you're now here, and now the XOR between those two, the only thing bits left in the XOR of those two is 0, 1, 0. Because you, you, all you've got left now is one step in Y to go. And so the last step you do is just 0, 1, 0, one step in Y, and it goes down the wire, down the Y wire. And if it's a zero, you go up the Y wire. So I'll leave it as an exercise for you to go through that in more detail. But the idea is in, in a hypercube, you can route from anywhere to anywhere else just by knowing your node number, the other person's node number. You know, think about that example there. If you have a seventh dimensional hypercube, it's difficult to get your brain around how you would root on that, but it's actually quite simple. You take, if you're node 47 and you talk to node 92, you write those in binary, XOR them. Only way you have a difference in those bits is where you have to send down a link, and you have to send down the link down dimension five, dimension three, and dimension one, say. And you can go down those, those three links of the three you have to go down, and you go down in any order. Because you know that if there's three ones in the X or the two numbers, there's only three ones left, you're three steps away. It doesn't matter which order you take them in. So the routing algorithm can either go always X first, then Y, then Z, and so on. Or it could just do them random order, it doesn't matter. Um, but the route you take to the far end is explicit, and the order you do it in, you can choose. You can do whatever you want. Um, and even if you have a bad link, if this network link in the network was broken, data travelling from here to here, destined for here, would say, I want to go one step in X, in Y, sorry, to get to there. But if that link was damaged, then it might just send the packet, it wouldn't send the packet back to where it went to, it would send it, say, to this one. And now, knowing where you are here, it now knows how to get from there to there. It, can, it will try, let's say, going up there, then there. So it's actually quite fault tolerant as well. Because if packets go get pushed away from the way they should, would want to go, it still always knows how to get back to where it should be going. So routing is, is nice on hypercubes. Um, I've just drawn the four-dimensional one out a bit bigger. Um, and again, you can see the idea that now there are four dimensions, an X and a Y, Z and a W. And you can see where you go to to get that you're at most four steps away from somewhere else because you might have to go down this link and then this link and then this link so and this link so that's usually four links away never more than four links away from anywhere else some algorithms for example global sum you need to know the sum of the number that each each node's got a number in this case there are 16 numbers how to find the sum you can find the sum in four steps so what you do first is every node sends data, they exchange the data with their X neighbor, call this the X dimension. So he sends to him, he sends back again. And the two of them add their numbers together. So now every node knows the sum of their own and their neighbor in X. So he now knows the sum of two numbers. You then exchange in Y. Everybody sends a packet with their sum to the one that's in the Y dimension from them. And he sends one back and adds them together. Now he knows the sum of those two and those two. So that node now knows the sum of those four. And he also knows the sum of those four, although he added them in a different order. You then exchange in Z and then in W. So in four steps, everybody has exchanged something with somebody else and can add that number in. So in four steps, you can add up 128 numbers. Not in 128 steps, but only four. So algorithms like that, which is called a butterfly algorithm, can be done quite efficiently by swapping in X, swapping in Y, swapping in Z, and adding. So global sums, the same thing applies for maximum. If in an algorithm, you might want to know what the biggest number is. If there are 16 numbers, in four steps, everybody knows what a maximum is, because they exchange in X and add, or take the maximum and exchange in Y, and so on.
Um, the, most networks now, apart from the Cray ones, are factories. An example is, that's what it looks like, where you have nodes connect together and then they connect together by... Um, so it's a tree, but it's a factory because there are more links. As you go up the network, there are more and more links. Otherwise, you'd need one wire from here to here and here to here, but from there you'd need two. Otherwise, if both of those were communicating, there'd be a congestion there. Um, some people, traditionally mathematicians, call these Kloss networks after somebody called Mr. Kloss, who was German, uh, Charles Kloss, who wrote this paper in 1953. Um, the same thing also appears, Ben's, Ben's networks are related. Um, and these early ideas of networks were actually based on not computing, but telephony. How you create a network so that people in France, Germany, Italy, and all the other places, or cities, can talk to each other uh, with the minimum number of wires but no congestion. That's an example of a factory, that's a quadrix factory, because it's easy to draw. Each switch, which are the blue circles, has four links. And these are the compute nodes. And you can imagine that when this node here talks to any one of these three, it just goes via its blue switch and back again. And similarly for the others. If this one here wants to talk to, um, let's say, the last one over here, he clearly must use that link, and it must last come down this link to here. But he has a choice of which of the four blue circles at the top to go via. He could go up the first wire and down, or similarly for the other three. So there are four routes between here and here, and he can pick the best one depending on congestion. But also there are four nodes here. So if that node picks the route via the first blue circle, and the second one picks the num route by the third blue circle. Well, these two, there's now two left for them to talk via, and they can talk via one of the other ones. So every, all four of those can each talk to one of those four without sharing any wires. And that's called full bisectional bandwidth. If it's possible for every node, every node to have established a link with any other concurrently without sharing any wires. As you build that bigger, that's the next stage bigger than that. Uh, you can compare it a bit to the um, hypercube in terms of complexity. That you take one switch that can connect four things, so you have four nodes off it and four uplinks, connect those into a block which can connect together 16 things, connect together eight of those, connect 128 things. And so most clusters with InfiniBand are fat trees. Um, I'm quickly going to look at some other more esoteric ones that haven't really caught on, but they do exist, and mathematicians like it. Um, one is the Omega network, where I said before, with the hypercube, as drawn over there, that you can route from anywhere to anywhere else just by knowing the, your own starting point number and the end point number, so node 42 to node 83. If you write those in binary, you can use the difference to ha find the route through the network. Um, the Omega network is simpler than that. You don't need to know where you're starting from. All you need to know is where you're going to. Um, and in this case, and the next slide is easy to read, because um, I've drawn it a bit bigger. If you're trying to reach node 4, you know that um, node 4 in binary is... Um, one zero zero. If you say that one is um, down and zero is up, then from any node, if I go um, take the bits of the bottom end, so the first is, is whether it's odd or even, you go straight across because it's a zero. Straight across that's a zero. I've got this wrong, haven't I? No, one means down there and then zero top top. Yes, yeah, so you take the, the way I've drawn it here. Node 4 in binary is 100 zero, zero in binary. 1 means take the down fork, the bottom one, and 0 means take the top. So you go, for any step, you go 1 means down, and 0 means the top link, and top link, and you're there. But the same route works from anywhere. So if you start here, and the first 1 means take the um, down link, to there, and then up, up, you get to that one. 
So the Omega network has the property that the route you take from anywhere to anywhere else is the same. Everybody, everybody's routing byte to get to a certain target node is the same. And it's based on the binary of what you're going to. So it's, what, it's an example of destination-based routing. All you need to know is the destination where you're going to. You don't need to know where you're coming from. And the binary representation of your target tells you which lefts and rights to take. Right. Um, there's an example there of drawing it. However, these networks aren't perfect. In fact, apart from the fully connected network, no network is perfect. Apart from where everybody connects to everybody else, there is congestion. So if two nodes here connect to number five, they start off okay, but the last link from that switch to that switch goes down the same wire. So the maximum bandwidth you can get, if the bandwidth is capable of 10 gigabits, the maximum that those can send out is five, because they're, although this link can be run at 10, this link will be running at 10 shared between the other two. So where you do get congestion, you lose half your bandwidth at least. A couple of other examples, because they're interesting, no one's ever built computers out of it, particularly. There's a, the hypercube, like there, has the property that as you build it bigger, the switch you need to build it out of gets bigger and bigger. So the switch you need to build it there, and that one needs a three-way switch, but the next one you need a four-way switch, and so on. And the more complicated the switch is, the more expensive it is. And if you're a, a computer seller like SGI, if you want to sell systems up to 128 nodes, you have to design a switch which is good for eight-way connections. But if you sell a customer an eight-node system, they only need a three-way one. So you're selling them a switch there which is good for eight dimensions of communication, but they only need three. So it makes small systems expensive, and so SGI lose business because their systems seem expensive at that size. But whereas they are efficient at the larger size, because the vendors don't want to make lots of different switch chips, they want to make one switch which fits all. There's a variant of that, which I've drawn in 3D, cube connected cycles, where you slice the corner off the cube and put three nodes there. And it has the property that you never need more than three links per node, even if you go to four dimensions, five dimensions, and so on. Um, there are no known commercial implementations of that, but it's, mathematically it's very good. Um, there's one more I was going to put, final example was the quartz graph, uh, which was an example used by um, SGR. Um, so there should be a picture there that's not shown, there was a picture there that's missing. Um, there's a company called Psycortex, which produced recently, or it's now no longer selling them, a computer with a weird network topology, where if you took all the nodes, the route from A to B was different from the route from B to A. So a packet going from node A to node B went one route, and the way back was another route, because it was based on acyclical graphs, which were one-dimensional, one unidirectional. Whereas otherwise, in networks, you assume the route through the network going that way is the same as the route you come back. Um, right, just to finish. Um, when you talk about networks, what you really want is this fully connected so everybody can talk at full bandwidth. But you can't achieve that. And so what you tried to say is, is your network, does it have full bisexual bandwidth or reduced bisexual bandwidth? Because you're thinning out the network. You're not connecting out all the possible connections. In thin bandwidth fat trees is, in theory, a full bisexual bandwidth. Because every node, like that diagram I showed with the little uh, pink rectangles, in theory, every node can communicate with every other without sharing a link. But unless everybody collaborates and agrees they'll if I go from here to here, I'll go this way, so you don't go that way, then you will get congestion. So if the routing algorithm, each node makes its own choices, you will get contention. So although InfiniBand networks are supposed to be full bisexual bandwidth, you never achieve it, because always there's congestion. And what you try to do in your routing algorithm is you try to arbitrate so it does the least worst thing. But in general, a a non-blocking network is a network where, in theory, everybody can communicate with everybody else without sharing a wire. Um, if the, you do have to share wires, you have a reduced bisexual bandwidth, which means that if you're running an algorithm across a thousand nodes, then if, two of the, if any two of those a thousand share a wire between them each other, then the best bandwidth you can get is half what you might be expecting. The fix to that is adaptive routing. 
There are not many examples of that. Quadrix had adaptive routing, um, but unfortunately, uh, and uh, Cray has an adaptive routing, but um, InfiniBand doesn't. InfiniBand static routed. And the idea of adaptive routing is like the examples here. You, set, you, you fire your packet in the network saying, I want to go to here, but without saying exactly which way to go. And as it passes through the network, the network says, well, hang on a minute, this link is, if I'm going from here now to here, I can either go this way or this way. Adaptive routed means that when it arrives there, that switch says, well, I've just sent a packet down that one, so I'll use that one instead. And now the packet ends up here or here. It knows where it's trying to get to, and it knows that it's that link, or, you know, it knows which way to go. So adaptive routing is a great idea in networks. It appears in um, the nodal network, but doesn't appear in InfiniBand. And without it, although in theory you have full bus actual bandwidth, in practice you don't. Right, we have two minutes left. Just to summarise what we have, um, different classes of network. Um, InfiniBand is what most HPC systems are built out of that are commodity. Uh, if it's proprietary, you may have a network built by Cray, IBM, SGI, where they make their own switches and chips. Um, although we talk about InfiniBand and Cray's, half the top 500 list built out of Ethernet. So don't dismiss Ethernet. There is a lot of Ethernet is used in HPC because it's cheap. Every server comes with it free. In terms of vendors, um, InfiniBand, really there's only one vendor left in InfiniBand. When InfiniBand was launched 10 years ago, there were 15, 20 vendors, but they've been bought out by each other and consolidated. So the most recent, for example, Mellanox bought Voltaire. Both companies are based in Israel. Uh, one just bought the other. So now there's only one of that line. And then in the other line, you had companies like uh, QLogic and, well, QLogic had just been bought by Intel, and they're secretly producing something very clever they're going to announce in two years' time. Um, but they themselves bought a path scale and bought another one. So that InfiniBand was sold as being generic, like Ethernet, you can buy from anybody, but it really is down to one vendor now, Melnox. So Melnox control the pricing and the product development. There are other companies out there. Um, Numascale, uh, based in Norway, uh, have very clever network topology in a card. Uh, Nodal, uh, which is what Quadrix became, have a clever way of doing kind of Ethernet, but these other ones have, have now gone. So 10 years ago or five years ago, there's quite a range of vendors with different networks. The list of networks is now reducing. Right, so just about 5.2. Um, just say on InfiniBand, you've seen all this before, um, most systems out there are quad data rate, new systems are 14 data rate. The difference between quad and 14 is about 20% faster. It's marketing. InfiniBand has always been good at marketing, and quad to 14 does not mean it goes from 4 to 14. It's marketing. Um, but that's what InfiniBand stands at the moment. What it looks like in a cluster, just to finish, this is what Bulb make. This is three racks. You build it out of building blocks, which are blade-based in our case. These purple things are InfiniBand switches. So that's what an InfiniBand switch looks like, it's one new, with lots of cable connections, and that's what a blade chassis looks like with its own InfiniBand at the back. This cluster has got one, two, three, four, five, six of these. It's got three of those, or four, there's one there as well. And also you have your management nodes as well, and you put cables only between the blue bits and those, and that in the diagram before, those are your top switches. As we